بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asirat al-Nabawiya, the prophetic biography. What we've been talking about over the last few sessions is the Prophet sallallahu arrival and settling in al-Madinah al-Munawwara, the city of Yathrib, which now, of course, was Madinah al-Nabi, al-Madinah al-Munawwara, al-Madinah al-Nabawiya, the illuminated city of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we've talked about a number of different things. We talked about the Prophet sallallahu arrival, his temporary stay at the place of Quba, which was a suburb of Medina. Then, of course, the Prophet sallallahu advancing on into Medina, performing the first Salatul Jumu'ah that the Prophet ﷺ conducted there in the city of Medina, uh, designating and establishing the not just the location, but the actually constructing the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, Al Masjid Al Nabawi Al Sharif, the Prophet's blessed mosque. Um, we also talked about the Prophet ﷺ bringing in the rest of his family members um, and the Prophet ﷺ temporarily residing in the home of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. Then once his family members arrived, the Prophet ﷺ had his actual apartments and his homes constructed and settled in with his family. Some of the other things that we've also talked about is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ reached out and established certain ties and tried to build bridges and relationships with uh, some of the leadership uh, there in the city of Medina, um, both amongst the uh, munafiqun, the hypocrites, just so that they wouldn't have any valid complaint against the Prophet ﷺ. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ reached out to the Jewish leadership and the Jewish tribe and started to really scope out and figure out the situation in Medina. The Prophet ﷺ also established the bonds of brotherhood between among some of the Sahaba. Okay. All right, go sit down over there. Go sit down. Zakhlaq here. So the Prophet ﷺ also then, you know, uh, established the bonds of brotherhood between the Muhajirun and the Ansar to make sure that he established a solid community and one that was able to work past a lot of the issues that they had in the past, um, such as the ongoing war or rather the, 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 the quarrel that was there, the bad blood that was there between the tribes of the Ansaros and Khazraj. He settled that and put that behind them. Muhajirun and Ansar became like brothers of one another. So the community was really starting to move forward. Now, one of the interesting things um, that the Prophet ﷺ then, you know, he focused on was the establishment of the five times daily prayer. If you remember in the last session, we talked about how when they first came and settled in Medina, there was that illness or that sickness that most new residents or visitors to Medina would oftentimes be struck by, whether it was some type of malaria or fever or, you know, a virus or whatever the case was. There was some bacteria, but there was something that would cause an illness, especially to people who were new visitors who hadn't developed a, a certain amount of immunity to that problem that was there in Medina. And of course, we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ made dua, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed that until today. Medina has, has always been known as a place that is very comfortable, very healthy, very refreshing, and very rejuvenating. So it's quite the opposite. Instead of affecting negatively affecting people's health, people oftentimes will feel recovered when they go to Medina. And that was part of the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, um, to make Medina a place of blessing. <clears throat> the next thing that occurred was that the Prophet ﷺ really wanted to solidify the community. Now, there's an interesting little tidbit that I'd like to kind of reach back and recall from the earlier sessions of the seerah that we covered. If you'll recall, we talked about <clears throat> back when the message of prophethood began, the nubuwa started. When the Prophet ﷺ first received divine revelation and he came home and shared the message with his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, one of the first things that was done was Jibreel alayhi salam shows the Prophet ﷺ how to pray, how to perform the salah. Um, and this is before Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. So it's not the five times daily prayer that we know. That would happen, you know, a decade later at the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. But just a basic prayer. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, 
Um, she actually says it used to be two rak'ahs at a time. It was two units. They were like nawafil. They were just extra prayers. Some scholars say that it was mandatory in the morning and in the evening, like fajr and uh, Maghri- uh, fajr and asr times. However, regardless of whether it was mandatory or it was optional, they were two two units, just two rak'ahs that they would pray. And Jibreel alayhi salam takes the Prophet sallallahu shows him how to do the wudu, and shows him how to pray. When Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha accepts Islam, the Prophet sallallahu teaches her how to make wudu, teaches her how to pray, and they pray together. When Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu accepts Islam, the Prophet sallallahu teaches him how to do wudu, teaches him how to pray, and then they all pray together. And this was one of the very first practices the Prophet sallallahu would establish. As soon as someone would accept Islam, he would teach them how to make make wudu, he would make wudu with them, and then he would pray with them and teach them how to pray, and they would pray together. To solidify, to strengthen the iman. You know, uh, one of my teachers always used to comment, he used to say that salah is the, you know, the shahadatain. The shahadatain. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. That, that the shahadatain, which is the testimony of faith, the statement of our belief, kalima tayyiba la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah. That Salah is la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah in physical form. Salah is the shahadatain manifest. It is the shahadatain manifest because we pray to Allah, obeying the command of Allah, implementing the command of Allah, fulfilling the obligation ordained upon us by Allah in the way performed by Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we do what Allah said in the way that the Prophet ﷺ did. And salah is very unique in that regard. Of course, all forms of ibadah, we only follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But this is such a structured, such a ritualistic um, form of ibadah and worship. This is such a um, structured and ritualistic form of ibadah and worship that... It um, completely is implemented according to how the Prophet ﷺ performed the salah. So that was always the first focus of Rasulullah ﷺ was to establish the salah because that would help establish their iman, that would help them realize their Islam. That would establish their Islam and help them realize their iman. Alright, so salah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he talks about ihsan as well, he talks about the aspect of worship. Even though it's a broader concept than just salah, but nevertheless, salah is a primary form where you can observe all levels of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Alright, so salah is very key, very integral, very central to the Islamic faith and the Islamic practice. Well, the Prophet ﷺ likewise implemented and realized that same exact practice um, to establish and solidify this community. So if he did that individually, with each individual believer in Mecca, and even collectively in the house of Arqam, bin Abil Arqam, Arqam radiallahu anhu, Darul Arqam, communally now, for the city of Medina, for this to be the first, you know, proper full Muslim establishment, he likewise instituted salah. So that's why they put up the masjid, they started building the masjid the very first day. They established, they found the, located the masjid, right, groundbreaking if you will. And the second day they started putting up the masjid, and they impl- immediately implemented the masjid, because salah had to be there. And often, I talk about this quite often, I talked about it back then when we discussed this earlier in the seerah, that you know, uh, uh, of the reason why the Prophet ﷺ prayed with his family, a family that prays together stays together. The Prophet ﷺ prayed together with the community, as salat bil jama'ah. as salat bil jama'ah. Because a community that prays together, sticks together. It's a community that is truly united. Alright? And, and if you really look at our communities, there's so much diversity in our communities. وَجَعَلْنَا كُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلٍ Right? Yes, Allah says, لِتَعَرَفُوا The only purpose why we have diversity is so that we have... Variety, just so we can recognize and identify one another and know one another. But at the same time, Allah does not negate the fact that we are diverse. So we will be very diverse. We will have a variety of people within the community. And we will still be united in spite of that. But if you really think about it, the one thing that unifies us across all means and across all boundaries is salah. When we pray together and the imam says, Allahu Akbar, we all go into sujood and put our faces down on the ground before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
You have an 81-year-old standing next to an 18-year-old. A hafiz of the Qur'an standing next to somebody who doesn't know Al-Fatiha. You have a PhD standing next to somebody who didn't finish high school. You have a millionaire standing next to somebody who doesn't have food for dinner. You have everybody and anyone, young and old, from all across the spectrum. Everybody stands together and prays together. So salah is the true unifier of a community. So salah is very important, very profound in that regard. And the Prophet ﷺ focused on establishing the salah when they came to Al-Madinah Al-Manawara. Now how did he go about establishing the salah? Let's you know, talk about that very quickly. The Prophet of Allah wasallam. You know, one of the first focuses of the Prophet ﷺ was, alright, how are we going to gather people together? So there are some narrations which allude to the fact that initially he would send out the Sahaba, and he would initially, he had even identified Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was a close companion of the Prophet ﷺ, very beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. Um, and he also had a very loud voice, meaning he had a very far-reaching voice. So he had identified Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he was like the right hand of the Prophet ﷺ. He was very close to him. And the Prophet ﷺ would depend on him quite a bit. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala would go everywhere the Prophet ﷺ went. So the Prophet ﷺ identified Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he would go out and he would announce, As-salatu jami'atun, as-salatu jami'atun, as-salatu jami'atun. Salah is gathering, salah is starting, salah is gathering, salah is starting. And he would make this announcement and people would kind of, and they would wait a few minutes until the people congregated and gathered together and then they would pray. But the Prophet ﷺ said, we need a better way to notify people that salah is starting because now we are a solid community. People are settling in and settling down. They're going to have lives. They're going to have work. They're going to have family. They're going to have business. They're going to have a bunch of things going on. How are we going to create a proper announcement for the prayer? How do we go about in doing that? So there are a couple of different narrations. One narration says the Prophet ﷺ gathered the Sahaba and he said, here's the task in front of us. We need to gather people for salah. What do you all think we should do? And there was a little bit of a, what we, what we call a shura, a mashwara, a consultation. And this right here exemplifies the teaching of the Qur'an, what the Qur'an tells us, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Right, that consult them in matters. And this is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ as well. مَا رَأَيْتُ أَكْثَرَ مَشْهُرَةً مِنْ رَسُولَهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. The companions say, one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ in fact says, I never saw anyone consulting people in issues and affairs and matters more than the Messenger wasallam. Thirdly, the Qur'an describes, وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ that a quality of the Sahaba and a quality of believers is that the way that they handle issues is that they consult one another. So consultation is very important. You know, and if anybody would be above and beyond the need for consultation, it would have been Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He receives divine revelation. He receives divine revelation. Sahibul wahi, sahibul shara. Right? He receives divine revelation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even instructed him to do so, to set a proper example and a precedent. And even the way that the matters would unfold, would practically teach us the good that was there in this act of shura and mashwara. So the Prophet ﷺ consults everyone, says, what should we do? Some of the companions offered the suggestion that we should, أَنْ يَجْعَلَ بُوكًا كَبُوقِ الْيَهُودِ Right, that some, some of them said that we can put up a flag or we can even sound a horn. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, هذا لليهود. He said, this is for something that the Jews do. We need to be unique. We need to distinguish ourselves in terms of our act of worship. And this again goes back to tell us that socially speaking, communally speaking, we might have collaborations and cooperations. There might even be certain things that we can learn from them and implement from them communally, structurally, organizationally, administratively. In worship though, we were told to be unique. Right? To, I, to create a unique religious spiritual identity. And that's very profound and very important. In fact, I was actually doing a lot of research maybe about a couple of months ago on the idea of religious identity formation. And it talked about the fact how all different types of identity, whether it be ethnic or whether it be you know, political or it be nationalistic and even religious, that it, ta- uh, it talks about how like over generations, over three generations, they continue to fade away until they become inconsequential. And we've seen that with a lot of different communities in front of us. But in order to maintain a strong religious 
identity, um, there's an important, there's a necessity of teaching and maintaining a lot of unique, you know, spiritual practices. And that helps maintain and confirm the identity of future coming generations. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted something truly unique. And so somebody offered the suggestion we should have a bell, naqus. And the Prophet ﷺ again said, هَذَا nasara." That this is what the Christians practice. We need something unique. And somebody offered the suggestion that we can light a fire. And they'll see the smoke or see the fire and they'll come. And the Prophet ﷺ said, هَذَا majus. This is what the Zoroastrians, the fire worshippers, the majus, this is what they practice. And so there was all this discussion. Finally the Prophet ﷺ kind of told everyone, well go and sleep on it, go and think about it. And sleep on it and let's see what, what happens. One of the other narrations also comes that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know, when this consultation was first done, or, or even before this was done, when the Prophet ﷺ initially talked about it, he actually goes into the marketplace to, you know, maybe try to construct like a bell or some type of a device that could help kind of raise awareness and announce to everyone that it's time for the prayer. And he had just bought like the initial like planks of wood that would used to be constructed maybe. And he went home, and this is where the story picks up from. So there's a Sahabi by the name of Abdullah bin Zayd bin Abdi Rabbihi. Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu anhu, something very interesting, unique about him, is that yes, he is a Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a companion of the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him. But what's fascinating is that not by any means is he considered from kibar sahaba For us, he is kabid, meaning he is somebody very respected and very great in our eyes and to us. But amongst the community of the sahaba, he was not in the ranks of the leadership. He was not in the ranks of the leadership. And his name doesn't come up very frequently as like a major uh, you know, person in that community, like a primary leader in that community. But he held a very unique position, and this was one of the very, very rare unique times where his name comes up. And the, the divine wisdom in this as well, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us through the example of Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu anhu, that anyone can be a contributor. It didn't always have to be the Abu Bakrs and the Umars and the Uthmans and the Alis radiallahu ta'ala anhu, but anybody could be a contributor. And a man whose name doesn't come up anywhere else in the seerah was a contributor. And a major contributor of something like the Adhan. Something that is min sha'a'ir al-Islam. It is from the unique signs of Islam. It is one of the key identifiers and markers of a Muslim community. Alright, and so... Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes home and he goes to sleep. He says in his sleep he sees that um, a man comes to him wearing you know, these two garments that are like green shaded. All right, green garments. He's wearing two of them, like I guess probably worn something like the ihram is worn. So two garments, a lower garment and an upper garment. He's wearing these two garments, and he comes and he kind of, you know, um, he he uh, he kind of walks around him, like he comes and kind of walks around him, and so he looks at him and he looks at him, and then he sees that there is that Abdullah bin Zaid. He sees himself in the dream that he's holding a bell. يَحْمِلُ نَاقُوسًا فِي يَدِهِ فَقُلْتُ ف, uh, So the, um, the, this man in his dream, he says, يَا عَبْدَ اللَّهِ أَتَبِعُ هَذَا النَّاقُوسِ Are you selling this bell? So Abdullah bin Zayd says to him, وَمَا تَصْنَعُ بِهِ What if I am selling this bell? Why would you want to buy it? Why would you want to purchase it? And so he says that, you know, we can... Um, so Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu anhu asks him, what would you want to do with it? And so he asks him, he asks Abdullah bin Zayd that, what were you planning to do with the bell? So he says, نَدْعُوا بِهِ لَا We would use it to call people to the prayer. So the, this man in the green clothes says to Abdullah bin Zayd, أَلَا أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى خَيْرٍ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Should I show you something better than that? So قُلْتُ وَمَا هُوَ What is that? What would be better? So he says, تَقُولُ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرَ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ أَشْهَدُ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهُ أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهُ حَيَّ عَلَى الصَّلَاةِ حَيَّ عَلَى الصَّلَاةِ حَيَّ عَلَى الْفَلَاحِ حَيَّ عَلَى الْفَلَاحِ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ He recites the adhan to him. 
And one narration, Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that the man actually, when he recites the adhan, he actually goes and stands up. Like he goes, there's like a half wall. He goes and he stands up on top of it and puts his hands to his ears. And he kind of calls it out very lo- loudly, elongating the voice. And he, and he demonstrates how he elongated the voice. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Right, like he elongated his voice. And he does this for him. In another narration, after he does that, he gets down from the wall, and then he tells him, At-Tathweeb. At-Tathweeb means when you want to let people know that now the salah is actually beginning. So that is to notify them that the time of the prayer has come in. So start getting ready, ready and working your way towards the masjid for the prayer. Then when it is time to actually start the prayer, he gets down from the wall, stands there at the place of prayer, and then calls the iqama. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Shadu wa la ilaha illallah, Shadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. There's two riwayahs riwaya about how he exactly called the iqama, right? Whether he called it mithl al-adhan or bil itar, or he did it singularly, and that's hasb al Both are completely authentically narrated from the Prophet wasallam, and both are valid practices, and the fuqaha have given preference to different ones based on which of the sahaba that they learned their fiqh from. In either case, he then calls the iqama. With the addition of qadaqamati salah, qadaqamati salah. All right. Indeed, the prayer has 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 like um, initiated, or the prayer has started. The prayer has stood up. Indeed, the prayer has stood up. Right. So he makes that proclamation. It adds it to the iqama, adds it to the wording of the adhan. And then Abdullah bin Zayd wakes up. Now Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu anhu, when he wakes up and he's seen this in his dream, the narration says he runs to the Prophet sallallahu And it's even before the time of Salat al-Fajr. And he gets there and waits for the Prophet sallallahu When the Prophet sallallahu comes out for Salat al-Fajr in the morning, he tells the Prophet sallallahu I saw this dream and this happened, this happened, that happened, that happened, this happened. So the Prophet sallallahu when the Sahaba gathered together, he says, tell them what you saw. And he tells them what he saw in his dream. And then the Prophet ﷺ then tells him, فَقُمْ مَعَ بِلَالْ فَأَلْقِهَا عَلَيْهِ فَلْيُؤَذِّنْ بِهَا فَإِنَّهُ أَنْدَى صَوْتًا مِنْكَ Then the Prophet ﷺ says, okay, Bilal, you stand up. And then he says, Abdullah bin Zayd, you stand next to him. And you feed him the words. Like one, you know, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then Bilal radiallahu ta'ala would call it, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then you feed him the words, basically. You instruct him how to call the adhan. And says that he should should call the adhan fal yu'adhin huwa bilal fa innahu andat sawtan minka because his voice is much farther reaching than yours and even the way the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says it has a lot of eloquence in it in the sense that not just physically but metaphorically and figuratively that bilal radiyallahu ta'ala anhu calling the adhan will have a greater impact and of course we know exactly what he meant by that impact that it shattered so many barriers that Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is leading the prayer bilal is calling the adhan and the iqama Think about the barriers that that shattered. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu is an African man in Arabian society. If we think people are racist today, people at that time were unbelievable. They treated people of another race lesser than they treated animals. Alright, so it shattered that, that, that barrier. And another barrier, Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to be a slave. He was born into slavery, born into slavery. And he was a freed man. So again, again, those people unfortunately had this class system where even though a man was free now, but because once upon a time, somewhere, he was a slave at one time, they considered him to be a little bit lower than the rest of them. And the Prophet ﷺ shattered that false standard. Right? He shattered that another prejudice and bias within the community. So he shattered so many. So when he says his voice will be much farther reaching, meaning in terms of its effect and implications. Right, and eventually the day of Fath Makkah would come, where the Prophet ﷺ would ask Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to stand on top of Baytullah al Kaabatu Sharifa. Right, he would have him stand on top of the house of Allah itself and call the adhan from there. Again, shattering all these different false standards and all these ridiculous prejudices and biases that existed within that community at that time. And and it reminds me even of another you know situation whether Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu was physically present there or not. I I can't recall, but it reminds me of another situation that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu during the time of his khilafah, when he would have like a general assembly meeting, right? Like a community town hall meeting, when everybody would come, he used to have a seating arrangement. 
Just like, you know, even if you have, you have like VIP seating, even if you're calling everyone, everyone can come and con- congregate and sit together. But you kind of have like some VIP seating where you reserve some seats for some VIPs. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu in front right around him, he would have VIP seating that was reserved for people. And some, some narrations say that no, he actually had like a seating chart. He would tell people where to sit. And, and that was to, again, kind of teach a lesson in the community. And it was people like Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the likes of Bilal radiallahu anhu. Which means the people who accepted Islam way back in the early days of Mecca. And sacrificed with their blood, their sweat, their tears. Right? For the sake of Islam. And, and they, they were there in the early days and they made a lot of sacrifices. He would sit them in the front. And a lot of times leaders of the Quraysh who accepted Islam much later on, like Abu Sufyan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, right? But accepted Islam at the time of Fatah Makkah, they would be sitting in the back, like at the entrance, where you know, people are walking in, walking out, and they're all trampling all over you. And then maybe it's the shoe section, so the shoes are back there, so it's kind of dirty, and you're kind of like, man, where am I sitting? Why well, I gotta sit in the shoe area? And so some of them came to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu afterwards, and he said, لماذا تفعل هذا بنا? Like, why do, why do you treat us like this? Why, what, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to do? Don't you know that you know, we're, we're leaders of our people and you have us sitting back there in the shoe area? Right? Like, why, why, why would you do this? Ya Amir al Mu'minin, like, not you know, rebelling against you, but we're asking, like, what is your wisdom and hikmah? And he said that, and they said, why do you make us sit over there? He says, I didn't make you sit over there. Ajlastukum kama ajlasakumullah. I just make you sit where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sat you. This is the order and the sequence that you served Islam in. So I'm just maintaining the order. First come, first serve. Right? And so he took that very literally. And um, so this, this reminds me of that as again. So the Prophet ﷺ is honoring Bilal radiallahu ta'ala. Honoring him. You know, and that's another thing we have to kind of think about is that, and I'm going to talk about this towards the end of the session right now, but a lot of times adhan is kind of like this responsibility, it's kind of like this thing, like, oh, who's going to call adhan? You call adhan, I'm not calling you call adhan. No, you call, okay, fine, I'll call adhan. Right? Like there's this mindset and this attitude. And there's like we almost, oh, well, maybe we don't, inshallah, alhamdulillah, over here everyone understands. But a lot of times people perceive almost like a lack of prestige with calling the adhan. Now, now leading salana, that's really prestigious. Leading salah, that's, that's, that's something special. Somebody asks you to lead salah, oh, okay, thank you very much. Zakallah khair. Right? Somebody asks you to call adhan, it's like, no, no, it's okay, brother, you go ahead and call adhan. Like, see this guy trying to make me call adhan. Right? And there's this weird mindset. I can tell you, like, from the perspective of, like, tulabul ilm and hufad of the Quran and the uh, imma and scholars, like, a lot of times there's this weird perception and mindset. When in reality, you know what it is? That what it is, is that calling the adhan is a great act of nobility and virtue and reward and honor and distinction. And leading the prayer is like the greatest responsibility and the biggest obligation anyone can take on. If we realize how honorable calling the adhan was, as the Prophet ﷺ said, we'd argue, debate and fight about it. And if we knew what a grave responsibility leading the prayer was, we'd be hiding in the bathroom. Right? I mean, it's just, it's just the God honest truth. Yes, when you are in a position of leadership and you are the most ahl, the most qualified to do it, you should step forward and lead. But I'm just talking about perception. Everyone jumps forward to lead the prayer because that's honorable. And everyone ducks and runs and co- looks for cover when it's time to call adhan because that's just like whatever. Calling the adhan is a real honor and distinction. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ bestowed that honor upon Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And in fact, what's even more remarkable to me personally, is that the two mu'adhins in Medina of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ were Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and the other one was Abdullah bin Umi Maktoum, who was elderly and blind. So one of the mu'adhins of the Prophet ﷺ was an African freed slave. Again, now think about that racist Arabian society at that time. And the Prophet ﷺ bestows the greatest honor upon this man. And then the second one was an elderly, poor, destitute, blind man who lived in poverty his entire life. And the Prophet ﷺ bestows his honor upon him. To again, shatter these types of barriers within the community. Nevertheless, moving on, 
So Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu calls the adhan. The narration says that, فَجَاءَ سَمِعَهُ عُمْرَ بِالْ خَطَّابِ وَهُوَ فِي بَيْتِهِ Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu didn't live too far away, heard the adhan in his home. فَخَرَجَ إِلَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَهُوَ يَجُرُّ رِدَاءَهُ So he came out of his home running, and he didn't even get fully dressed and clothed. You know how sometimes you like put on your pants, and you got like your undershirt on, and then you got like your shirt, and you run out like putting it on while you're jumping your car, and button it down or whatever. You know how you got that look, that bewildered look going about you, and you're like putting it on while you're driving, and you're buttoning your shirt up while you're driving. He was in that mode where he's just running and putting his shirt on while he's running. And so Rida, he had the shawl, and he's like, it's dragging behind him. And he comes in this state, and he's panting, and he's out of breath. And he says, Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Nabi Allah, like from the door. He's like, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah. O Messenger of God, O Messenger of God. بالحق, and that's why he swears. He says, I swear. I swear by the one who sent you with the truth. I swear to God. لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ مِثْلَ الَّذِي رَأَى I swear to God, I just saw the same thing in my dream that just happened right now. I saw this in my dream. And remember I was telling you that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu the day before had gone to buy two pieces of wood to maybe build like some type of a contraption or device to announce this time of the salah to the people. Will he buy some of the initial supplies, like a couple of pieces of wood, and he goes home and he goes to bed, he goes to sleep, and he sees in his dream, he sees in his dream that what is this wood that you've bought? And he's like, oh, you know, we're going to build a bell or something like this. So let me show you something a lot better. And same way the angel gives him the adhan. And he actually says in his dream that the angel descended down from the sky and stood there and called the adhan and then left. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, so this kind of confirmed what Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu had seen in his dream. And the Prophet ﷺ affirmed this. There's another narration from some of the scholars of the seerah, like Suhaili and some of the others who actually say that Jibreel, when, when Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes to the Prophet ﷺ and recites the adhan and tells him, this is what I just saw in my dream, that Jibreel, the angel Gabriel, Jibreel alayhi salam, comes to the Prophet ﷺ and affirms the fact that this is in fact the will of God. This is in fact the command of Allah. And this is to be established. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, why didn't the divine revelation come straight to the Prophet ﷺ? To involve the community. To involve the community. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ understood this, but through the example of the Prophet ﷺ teaching the, teaching the lesson that no leader will be independent of his flock and his community. But you have to depend on your community. And the best decisions are reached that are reached between, that are reached by communication between the leadership ranks and the community. The leaders and the followers, they have to come together. And no leader is ever independent of his community. Alright, and so this, and then not only that, but like I said before, this was a sahabi who's not very prominently mentioned. This is not in Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or Ali, or Abdurrahman bin Auf, or you know, Zayd ibn Haritha, or someone else of that caliber. This is like an ordinary sahabi, which of course an ordinary sahabi for us is still a really big deal. But relatively speaking, it's quote unquote an ordinary sahabi. But you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala involved him within the process. So this is basically how the salah came to be. And then the, the, excuse me, the adhan came to be, and then the iqamah was implemented as well. The narration says that when the following morning came, when it was the following morning, when Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu came to call us, now he's been calling adhan all throughout the day, and he's got the hang of this, and he comes in the morning time to call the adhan of fajr, and there were of course the ashabu suffa, and there were people sleeping outside the masjid, and he saw that, you know, maybe some of the candles weren't lit inside of some of the homes immediately around the masjid, so he kind of felt like maybe everybody was still a little passed out, everybody was so sleepy, so hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala falah, hayya ala falah, and then he kind of looks around and he's like, as salatu khayrum min an Right? Salah is better than sleep. as salatu khayrum min an Like seriously guys, salah is better than sleep, right? And he says that. And the Prophet ﷺ hears this, and the Prophet ﷺ comes out from his home, and he tells Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu that this is good, and establish this in your adhan. I approve. And of course we know that some unfortunately, very unfortunately, some later 
deviant groups have come along and talked about the fact that, oh, this is an innovation, and the fact that, you know, they made it up afterwards, and Umar put it inside of the adhan to just kind of change things up and do this and do that. It's all false, it's batil, it's preposterous, it's ridiculous. It's authentically established from an authentic narration in the ahadith that the Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu said it, and the Prophet ﷺ approved of it, and that's the end of that. And we know when the Prophet ﷺ approved something, what does the Qur'an tell us? وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He doesn't speak from his desires. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Everything the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, says is divine inspiration, revelation, and he speaks the will of God to the people. Alright, so the, this was divinely ordained by, the, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from that day on, it became a sunnah of the adhan of fajr. And it should be implemented in the adhan of fajr. With the adhan, this is a fiqh issue. There's a whole issue of fiqh of adhan. We've gone through with the seminary students, alhamdulillah. But maybe it's just a workshop for another day, inshallah. And we'll talk about this. Um, but just in the short term, just to kind of show you something that if somebody called the adhan of fajr without a salatu khayru min an would it be valid? It would be valid. But if somebody did it intentionally, they would be sinful for contradicting the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Because our deen, our religion is one of obedience, is one of following the example, it's one of respect. We show respect to those who deserve the respect. And at the forefront of those people who deserve our respect is Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the messenger and the Prophet of Allah. Peace and blessings be upon him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Finally, I guess to kind of... Uh, there's a very interesting narration that I found. Ibn Ishaq mentions this. And this is kind of talking about how like adhan is like... You know, there's a hadith of the Prophet some authentic that says, du'as are accepted between adhan and iqamah. Du'as are accepted between adhan and iqamah. So it talks about this. That overall the adhan is a very powerful thing. It's a time of acceptance of prayers and du'as. Right? That there's a narration, this woman from Imra'atum min Banu Najjar. Banu Najjar were the people that lived around the masjid. There was a woman from the people of Banu Najjar. Um, she says that my kana bayti min atwali baytin hawl al masjid. My um, wall, the like the wall of my courtyard, was one of the highest walls. At least for the homes around the masjid. So a lot of times when Bilal radiallahu ta'ala would want to call Adhan and want his voice to kind of project outwards, he would come, he had taken permission, and he would come stand up on the wall of my courtyard to call the Adhan from there so that the voice would reach out. And she said that I used to notice he would come early in the morning before Fajr time. And fayati bi saharin. He would have his suhoor with him. He would fast. And he would come early before Fajr time started, and he would have a couple of dates with him, and maybe a little bit of water. And he would come sit down on the wall, waiting, yantadhiru lil Fajr. He would sit and wait for Fajr time, and he would have his suhoor, and he would just kind of peacefully wait. And when it was time to call the adhan, when he would see that it was like time to call the adhan, she said that I would see him, he would stand up on the wall, and before he would start calling the adhan, he used to make dua. He used to make dua. And she recalls his dua that he used to make. He used to say, Allahumma ahmaduka. Allahumma ahmaduka. Oh Allah, I praise you. Wa asta'inuka ala Quraysh and yuqimu dinaka. And I seek your assistance against the Quraysh that they do not get in the way of your deen being established. Right? He would make this dua. He would make this dua and then he would call the adhan. So it, it just, I thought it was very interesting that, you know, Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the first mu'adhin from the very beginning, establishes this practice of, you know, making dua at the time of calling the adhan. Now a couple of little uh, beneficial points. Of course the person, we'll talk about the virtue of the mu'adhin himself. We'll end with that to end on a motivational note. But what is the obligation? Of course, one person calls the adhan, everyone else hears the adhan. What do those who hear the adhan, listen to the adhan, what are they supposed to do? The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ taught us is to repeat after the adhan. 
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar to yourself quietly. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Repeat after the adhan. When the mu'adhan says the words, Hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah. Instead of that, we say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That there's no uh, ability to avoid evil and no strength to do good except through the permission and the help and the will of Allah. So we say that at the time because Hayya ala salah calls us to the prayer, calls us to success. So that we say that in response that basically only Allah Allah can make this possible for us. So may Allah make this possible for us. And then the Prophet ﷺ, of course, at the conclusion of the adhan, taught us to make the dua. Allahumma rabba hadhi da'wah titama. O Allah, the Lord, you are the Lord of this complete invitation and call to Islam. Hadhi da'wah titama. Was salat al qa'ima. You are the Lord and the Master of this prayer that is about to stand. Ati Muhammadan al wasila ta wal fadila. That give the Prophet at Muhammadan al wasila ta wal fadila. Give the Prophet ﷺ the means to intercede before you and give him the status and the place of virtue. وَبَعَثُ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا And raise him up on the very praiseworthy station and status on the Day of Judgment. الَّذِي وَعَدْتَهُ That you promised him, إِنَّكَ لَا تُخْلِفُ الْمِيعَادِ O Allah, you do not negate, you do not go against, you do not violate the promises that have been made. And so this is a dua that should be made afterwards. And it's an act of great virtue to make that dua afterwards as well. So this is a little bit about the act of performing the adhan and how to conduct ourselves when the adhan is being performed and the adhan is being called out rather. And um, it's, it's like I said before, this was a sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ established from the very first day from the beginning of the community Real briefly and quickly, just wanted to talk a little bit about the virtues of calling the Adhan. And then I wanted to end with a very interesting tidbit that I found, just kind of going through and looking back through some of the notes on the seerah that we've done. The Prophet ﷺ, um, he's mentioned many, many different virtues for calling of the Adhan. In one narration, the Prophet ﷺ says, المؤذنون أطول الناس أعناقاً يوم القيامة That the people who call the Adhan will have the longest necks on the Day of Judgment. And some explained it literally, but it can be also be understood figuratively, meaning that they will stand out. They will stand out. They will rise above everyone else on the Day of Judgment. And there's a profound wisdom in this. The one who calls, adalu ala al-khayri kafa'ilihi. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, somebody who calls to a good deed, is, is it, it's as if he has done a good deed. Meaning what? If I call or facilitate a good deed for someone, he gets the reward of the deed, but I also get an equal amount of reward for him doing the deed. So the one who calls the adhan and notifies everyone of the prayer, not only gets the reward for praying himself, but he will get the reward of everyone else who prays as well. So it's a great virtue. So they will stand above everyone else on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ أَدْبَرَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَهُ دُرَاتِ When the adhan is called, the shaitan runs away from there. Shaitan, he's not afraid of much. But when the adhan is called, he runs away from there. لَهُ دُرَاتِ And he's breaking wind as he runs. Right? He loses control of his bodily functions. He's so terrified. He soils himself as he runs. لَا يَسْمَعُ التَّأْذِينَ حَتَّى لَا يَسْمَعُ التَّأْذِينَ Until he doesn't hear the adhan. He runs as far as he has to, to not hear the adhan anymore. You know, now that the adhan can be heard in the parking lot, that just means that shaitan has to run a little bit farther in Irving now, mashallah. Alright, so he runs as far as he can no longer hear the adhan. He runs to Andalus. Alright? فَإِذَا فَإِذَا قُضِيَ النِّدَاءُ When the adhan is done, أَقْبَلَ He comes back. To mess with the people. Hatta إِذَا thuwiba. But until the iqama is called again, then when the iqama is called again, adbara. He runs again for his life until he can't hear the iqama. When the iqama is done, he comes right back. Aqbala hatta yakhtura bain al mar'i wa nafsihi. And then he starts to mess around with people in their salah. And he says, Undur kada wa kada. Wadkur kada wa kada. Think about this, think about that. Look at this, look at that. Remember this, remember that. Then he messes around. Hatta yadilla rajulu la yadri kam salah. Right Until he gets a person to a point where he doesn't remember how many raka'ahs he's prayed. Alright, so shaitan, that's the trap of shaitan, but the adhan is what defeats him. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ says, لَوْ يَعْلَمُ النَّاسُ مَا فِي النِّدَاءِ وَالصَّفِ الْأَوَّذِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَجِدُوا إِلَّا أَنْ يَسْتَهِمُوا عَلَيْهِ لَسْتَهَمَوْا The Prophet ﷺ says that if people knew how much reward there was in calling the adhan and praying in the first line, and the mu'adhan gets both, the mu'adhan gets both, Right, he calls the adhan and he prays in the front row. 
If people knew how much reward was in these two things, and the only way and they couldn't decide who would do it, that they would basically have to like, like you know, draw lots. Like, okay, today you get to pray in the first row, then tomorrow y'all get to pray in the first row. Today you, Adan, tomorrow you, day after, day after. Like, we had to end up doing that. Like, Imam Zia had to come and be like, enough. Right? Here's the official Adan schedule. I'm tired of you people fighting, right? Like, in this very awesome British accent, right? So if Imam Zia had to end up coming and doing that, like the Prophet ﷺ said, people would go to that extent. If they knew how much reward there was in calling the Adan. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Subhanallah, it's so beautiful. Uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu is giving advice to another man. And he says that, I've noticed, إِنِّي أَرَاكَ تُحِبُّ الْغَنَمُ الْبَادِيَةِ I notice that when you go to graze your flock, like your sheep and your goats and stuff, when you go, you like to kind of go very far away from town and maybe even, you know, kind of like leave for a few days. You camp out, you sleep out, out in the hills, and you know, you kind of enjoy that little mini vacation. I, I noticed you like doing that. And he said, yeah, I enjoyed getting away from it, all the action sometimes. So he said that when you're way out there, and the only things around you are your goats and your sheep and trees and grass and, and the hills and the stars and those types of things. He said, when time for salah comes, call the adhan and farfa sawtaka bin nida. Call the adhan loudly. Allahu Akbar. Call the adhan loudly. And then he says, فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَسْمَعُ مُدَى صَوْتَ الْمُؤَذِّنِ جِنٌ وَلَا إِنْسٌ وَلَا شَيْءٌ إِلَّا شَهِدَ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He said, everything that hears the voice of the mu'adhin, whether it's a human, whether it's a jinn, whether it's anything, the grass, the leaves on the tree, the animals, the insects, everything that hears the, the voice of the Mu'addin when he calls Adhan will testify on that person's behalf on the Day of Judgment. Oh Allah, he used to proclaim your name in the world. He used to scream out your name, oh Allah, at the top of his lungs. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Right, so such beautiful virtues and rewards for a calling of the Adhan. And... So this was just a little bit about the virtues of calling the adhan. And, and one of the side notes that I should mention is, we should do everything we do with ihsan. Yes, it's very virtuous and very beautiful to call the adhan and we should do so. But everything we do, we should do with great virtue and reward. And do it with ihsan, do it to the best of our ability. You know, when we want to do anything, we learn how to do it. So that you can do it properly. Where we're doing something as noble and as beautiful and as blessed and as a great tradition as the Adhan. Been going on for over 1400 years. From the time of Rasulullah ﷺ. Right? To follow in that great tradition, call the Adhan. Be enthusiastic, be excited and want to call the Adhan. Yes. But just put in a little bit of time. Maybe an hour. With the Hafiz, with the Imam, with somebody to learn how to call the Adhan properly. Right, it's the name of Allah. We go to great lengths to speak properly and do everything properly and dress properly and you know conduct ourselves properly. If I'm going to stand up and proclaim the name of Allah, just learn how to do it properly. That's the only thing I ask. Right, that we learn how to do it properly. And that shows concern. That shows real care and consideration. That shows that I respect the deed. That I will learn how to do it. And it doesn't take more than 30 minutes. You sit down with the Hafiz for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour at the most, he'll teach you letter for letter, sound for sound, how to properly call the Adhan. And it's not about beautiful voices. It's about just enunciation, pronunciation. Because you are named, saying the name of God, saying the name of Allah. Somebody mispronounces my name, I correct them like that. If somebody walked up to me and said, Oh, so I come brother Abdul Nasir, I'd be like, it's Abdul Nasir actually. Wa alaykum as <laughs> you know, if he says, Asalaamu Alaikum, Brother Abdul Nasir, I'll say, My name's Abdul Nasir, and Wa Alaikum Asalaam. I won't even say Wa Alaikum Asalaam. First, I'll correct my name. Why? You got my name wrong. Look at that dude saying my name wrong. Right? Like, you know, you correct your name right away. The name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can learn how to recite it properly, inshallah. So, learn how to call the adhan. The last thing I wanted to mention, and I was just fascinated by this. Um, I was just looking over the old notes because you know we're talking about Medina and of course you'll recall and if you don't recall go back and listen to the Sira podcast qalaminstitute.org slash podcast the Prophet ﷺ visited Medina which was Yathrib at that time in his childhood with his mother when he was six years old and they stayed there for a month Right? That I just was looking back like was there any connection between his arrival in Medina now and when he was there you know 
47 years ago? Is there, is, is, there, is there any connection I can find? Like anything that the books mention? And I found something. And it just blew my mind. Ibn Sa'ad mentions in his tabaqat that the Prophet ﷺ had very strong memories from that month that he had spent in his childhood in that city of Medina when he was Yathrib. He had very strong memories when he went back for, after the migration. And when he would pass by the homes of Banu Adi, when he would pass by the homes of Banu Adi, which was a tribe of Khazraj in Medina, he was passing by one time, and he said, فَقَالَ هَذَا نَفْسُ الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي مَكَثَتْ فِيهِ أُمِّي He said, this is the same exact house. He stopped outside a house and he said, this is the house that me and my mom stayed in when we came, 47 years ago. And he said, وَهَذِهِ الْبِرْكَةُ الَّتِي تَعَلَّمْتُ السَّبَاحَةَ فِيهَا And there was a little pond, and he said, and this is the pond that I learned how to swim. This is the pond in which I learned how to swim when I was six years old. With the other Yathrabi kids, with the other Khazraji kids, the Medinan kids. وَكُنْتُ أَلْعَبُ فِي هَذَا الْمَيْدَانِ And then he pointed to this open area, open land, and he said, this is where I used to run around and play with the kids. It's the house we stayed in. This is the pond I learned how to swim in. And this is the field where we used to play in. And it just, the reason why it struck me was it humanizes the Prophet ﷺ. Like it makes him so real. They remembered his childhood memories. And you can imagine, you know, when he thinks back at that and he looks at this, it probably reminded him of his mother. And he probably thought about his mother. And he thought about his childhood. And he thought about all his experiences, how, where he started from, where he had come to. And just thought it was so profound and so beautiful. And really humanized the Prophet ﷺ. So inshallah, we'll go ahead and uh, conclude here. We'll stop here for today's session inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability um, to learn about the life of Rasulullah ﷺ. And may Allah give us the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. We learned some practical things about Adhan as well. جزاكم الله خيرا سبحان الله وبحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك